I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be in Colorado. Uh, and I want to start by sharing my story of, of coming to Colorado because I think it relates directly to what the rest of this presentation is about, which is about planning for your future uh, and about making choices uh, so that you're engaging your brain and engaging your, I would say, your soul in the most meaningful way. Uh, and when I say soul, I'm not, I'm not talking about any religious sense of soul. I'm talking about more your spiritual core sense of self. So I moved to Colorado in August of 2014, specifically to join Janice into this role. Uh, and I, I moved from New York City with my wife and my two kids. And I apologize for overpopulating the state with, with New Yorkers. Um, but we're, we're, our heart is here, right? We really do feel that Colorado is home uh, after this year and a half that we've been here. Um, and why did I move here? Um, I was living in New York. My whole family is from there. My wife's family is from there. Uh, and I had a job that I thought was sort of going to be the job that I had for the rest of my life. I was making more money than I ever had. Uh, I was the head of a particular group at another firm. Uh, I could walk to and from work. My kids were going to school, their private school in New York City, and my wife worked there, so they were able to go uh, as part of a perk for her. We lived in Manhattan, which to some of you may be a good thing or a bad thing, but it was actually a pretty good life. We lived a couple blocks from Central Park on the Upper West Side. It was fantastic. And, but there was something that was missing for me in, in my life, and, and I started to see it shortly after I got this job that I'm describing to you. I started gaining weight. Uh, I was drinking more than I ought to. Uh, I wasn't engaging with my wife and my kids in the way that I wanted to as an adult. And I had to start really questioning what were the values and the important things for me to focus on in my life. And I made a decision with my wife and, and, and we moved to Colorado, primarily because the opportunities for fully embracing the things that I am passionate about the outdoors, helping people in a meaningful way uh, in the work that I do at Janus Labs, uh, and then also just the balance of work and life were more important than the rat race that was going on in New York. And why I tell you that is because as you enter retirement, and some of you are already in retirement or have been in retirement for some time, or as you approach that retirement age, we have to think about what happens beyond that. We have to think about what we are going to do to engage ourselves and nourish ourselves physically, certainly, but also spiritually and mentally. And many people go into retirement and they lose some of those connections that they might have had in the past. They lose the connection that they have to their coworkers. As they get older and they don't have established hobbies, they start to fall into a pattern that doesn't necessarily benefit them so that they can enjoy the fruits of their labor into retirement. But what are you doing to invest in yourself? What are you doing to ensure that in those years following retirement that you've got the physical and mental health necessary to enjoy that? And that's what I really want to talk to you about. We're going to primarily be talking about things that distract us from staying on the path. All of these things exist today. I mean, think about when you first became aware of network news. How many channels were there that were giving you news? Three, right? Now today you've got CNN, MSNBC, Fox News around the clock. The amount of information and the distraction that we have today. How many of you have smartphones? Show of hands, right? Wow, I mean, just the, the, the sheer number. The, the Apple iPhone is, what, 10 years old? Less? 10 years. And you think about the advances, the amount of information that we have that is distracting us and draining our brain. And when we have these distractions, it causes a bunch of different things. One of the primary things it causes for us is stress because we're constantly thinking about different stuff. And we don't have time to recharge. We don't have time to reboot in the way that we did in the past. And chronic stress, a little bit of stress is OK. People misunderstand when I talk about stress. They think that stress is bad. You should never be stressed. My mother-in-law is like that. She's like, you never be, no, she's from Russia. She's like, never be stressed. Always be happy. I'm like, that's not realistic. 
Stress is actually good for you in small amounts. No pain, no gain is built on that concept that you stress something so that it can grow. But chronic stress, chronic overuse, can lead to illness, obesity, heart disease. They say that more than 80% of doctor visits today are the result of stress because it can cause these symptoms. So that's one of the things that we have to think about is how do we reduce stress? How do we reduce the amount of overworking our brain that we have? And we're going to be talking about that. This chart shows the sad truth. The sad truth is that as we get older, and at 45, I'm starting to experience this myself. I don't quite recall things as quickly or remember as much as I'd like. I find myself saying, I know that I was thinking about something 30 seconds ago, but I don't remember what it was. And the reality is, is that after the age of 30, 35 on this chart, our cognitive capability, our horsepower in our brain, starts to decline. That's just a natural fact of us getting older. Our ability to process as quickly and, and do things, it's just a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact of life, right? And as you can see, that as we get older, that, that decline becomes more steep. That's the sad truth. Now, here's the good news. Because I don't, I don't mean to show you that chart and have everybody sort of bummed out and I can see some faces in the audience that are like, where is he going with this? Because that doesn't sound good. The reality is, is that we can do certain things that help to stave off that cognitive decline. We can do things to help train our brain to learn better, to be more flexible, to be stronger, even as the physical element of our brain starts to decline. We've been able to see this because of the advanced neurological tools that are available to us today. And that's really the focus of what I want to talk to you about. It's part of why I moved to Colorado is because I felt that drain starting to happen to me in New York. The constant input, the constant stress, and realized that I needed to make a physical change in my location in order to ensure that as I go into my midlife and, and later years, that I am in an environment where that stress and that constant input is reduced and limited. So we're going to talk about a couple things. First, we're going to talk about setting the right foundation. Your brain is like a muscle. We want to make sure that you uh, have the right fundamentals before you start to uh, do some of these other things. And then we're going to talk about building your brain fitness. And overall, we're going to think about your training program. And I want you to think for just a moment, because this really is the part that ties all of what I'm going to be leading you through together. I want you to think about what your legacy is. Many people don't like to think about what happens when I'm gone. But I want you to think about what do you want people to say about you when you're gone? What do you want them to remember you for? Just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this, because I'm going to come back to the end of that and think about how we can tie all of this together. Okay? So the first thing I want you to do on page 18 of your books, it's at the back of the books, there's a little quiz. This is your pop quiz. And I want you to go through this. This is what we call our brain health assessment. And these are the foundational elements. If you could go through and just make a check mark next to any of the following items on pages 18 and 19 that are true for you. Nobody's going to grade this test. If you cheat, you're only cheating yourself. So please take a few moments and fill that out. OK. So what we're trying to do here is just give you a basic audit and assessment of these five areas of what we say are the foundational elements of brain health. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of give you a spoiler warning here is none of this stuff should be really new for you. If there's news in that you should eat a balanced diet or that you should get some exercise, then we need to get your hearing checked. Because this is basic stuff. The question that we ask and the, the experience that I've had with my clients, both my professional clients 
uh, in the advisory space, but also people like yourselves, is that we know this stuff, but we don't do it. We don't actually build the habits that are necessary for us to uh, take advantage of these foundational elements. So I'm going to go through them. And for the items that you had the least amount of check marks, that's where you might want to focus your energy and your time as we talk about these foundational pieces. So number one is, right, food is fuel. If you want to turn to page four, we've got some diagrams there that help you out with that. Now food is fuel, of course, we have to eat and that gets us, you know, the energy that we need to move through our day, right? The challenge being, uh, and I experienced this when I moved from, from New York to Colorado, is that if we're not working or we don't have hobbies that are making sure that we are active and burning calories, it can be tremendously challenging to maintain our weight. And certainly as we get older, our metabolism slows down and we start to put on some weight. And that becomes challenging for our health and our mental health, right? So on page four, we talk about this idea of peace sign meals. And many people, this one's a modified uh, peace sign that we have. Let me make sure I get it up here. So if you look down there at, uh, actually at the bottom of page uh, four, it gives you a sense of how much food should you be eating. And that seems to be one of the big challenges is we go to these restaurants or we go to the buffet and there's more than enough food. We can pile it on, right? So I want you to actually, if you hold out your hands in two cupped handfuls, okay? Two cupped handfuls. That's the amount of fruits and that's the amount of grains and vegetables that you should be having on your plate. So if you look at your plate and you see, is it more than two cupped handfuls, then you're overeating, right? The other element there is you hold up your hand and then just make, you curl your fingers down, right? Now look at the thickness of your hand. Now, sir, you have a, you have a large hand. Could you hold that up? Okay, look at his hand. Now see the size of his palm? That's the size of a piece of protein that he gets to eat. Okay, so congratulations. You get a nice, it's probably six ounce filet that you can get. Now, uh, let me see some other hands here. Let's see some other. You have a large hand too, sir. Okay, ma'am, would you hold up your hand? Would you mind? See, her hand is a little bit smaller. Unfortunately, your filet is four ounces, okay? <laughs> But that's the amount, if you look at, and the thickness, right? So that gives you a sense of how much food should I be eating. Now, the other element that people uh, fail to recognize is the idea of eating in between the meals. So when we grew up, and I'm part of this era where we were told to eat three square meals a day, and that's all fine and good when you were a cave person, when you didn't know where the next meal was going to come from, but anywhere here in Denver or anywhere really, almost in the United States, you can drive a mile and there's food to be had. It's not like we have to hunt and gather for our food anymore in the way that we used to. And the three square meals concept was built around that. Built around, you don't know when the next meal is going to come, so we need to fuel at these elements during the day. The problem is, is that we overeat in those three meals, and we end up uh, taking some of that excess calories and putting it here in our hips or some of us back here, right? And so... The idea of eating in between the meals, eating smaller meals, is supported by the cupped handfuls and the palm-sized piece of protein, but then also bridge your three square meals a day with a smaller meal in between, uh, 100 calories worth of, of peanuts uh, or nuts, some, uh, a cheese stick, a piece of fruit, foods that are going to last you, bridge you in between. right? And that actually has a result of increasing your metabolism because your body is trying to put that food to work put those calories to work. So my suggestion is eat smaller meals. The way that I do that, the habit that I have, is I don't use a dinner plate, I use a salad plate for my meals. And that just limits the amount of food that I can fit on there, right? And by the time I'm done with the food that's on there and I have to get up and go and get more, I kind of start feeling full. So it helps to, it's a habit, it's a trick that I have to help ensure that I'm eating the right amount. So that's food is fuel, right? The next one, is activity is activating, right? The idea that the more you exercise, the better, right? And what we want to make sure of is that you're getting the right amount of exercise. What I experienced moving from uh, New York to Colorado is 
I wasn't moving as much. I was spending more time in the car because I have to drive on 36 to come down to Cherry Creek to where Janice's offices are. And I was spending 40 minutes in the car each way. Right? In New York, I was walking to and from my office, walking to and from the subway, going out and walking around for lunch. And I was burning those extra calories. I put on about five pounds when I moved to Colorado, partially because of the beer, because it's so <laughs> plentiful and good, but also because I wasn't moving as much. I started having back problems. Right? I was sitting down so much of my day. So what kind of things do I do? Right? One of the things I do is I set an alarm on my, uh, on my calendar. For every uh, 45 minutes, I remind myself to get up and move around. Because working in an office, you sit down at a desk and you're looking at a computer screen. Fortunately, my job, I travel a lot, and I am walking around quite a bit. But I have to remind myself to get up and move around. So think about your day and how much of your time is spent sitting. What kind of habits can you put in place to ensure that you get a couple extra steps a day? Set your alarm on your smartphone to remind you to get up and walk around a little bit. If you like watching television, do it while standing up. Get one of those balance boards or a foam mat that, that engages your core. One of the things that I do, how many of you shop at a, you know, a, a, a familiar market each time that you have to go shopping, right? We all have a favorite place that we go. Or you go to these places, we don't have this as much in New York, but you have these massive parking lots. Massive. And where do you try and park when you go to the parking lot? As close as possible, right? Because why? I don't want to walk. And by the way, it's raining here all the time, so you have to be worried about getting rained on, right? <laughs> Isn't that the case? No. People tell me, they're like, oh, the winter in Colorado, whatever. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> And I don't want you to know, and I'm not going to tell you. I'm like, yeah, it's horrible. It's really, it's really miserable. <laughs> Park further away. You get a couple extra steps, and your car won't get banged up because not everybody's trying to park next to you, right? And it's nice out. You can enjoy that. Remind yourself. Put in these habits to do these things. That's part of the activity piece. So just think about what kind of habits you can put in place. Another one is balance stress. And we often are faced with stressful situations. We're going to be talking in a minute about flexibility and training your brain to think about stress in a different way. But balance stress. So making sure that you're stretching yourself a little bit, but not so much that you are panicked or worried all the time. So if you find yourself watching the news, which is just panic-inducing all the time, and it's there all the time, try taking the habit of not doing that of switching off, of reflecting, and finding time to sort of calm yourself down. Because it's a, it's a scary world right now. Between the markets and the global political environment, you just heard before from Mr. Bush talking about that, it's, it's, not, it's not a place that lends itself to sort of being relaxed. That means it's that much more important to spend that time switching off. Right? Switching off your cell phone, turning off the television, doing other things to regenerate your ability to withstand these sort of stressors. Because they're not going away. Resting is working. How many of you get a solid six hours or more of sleep a night? That's fantastic. I'm envious. I have a nine and an eight year old. They're in that phase where they wake up in the middle of the night and they're afraid because it's the middle of the night and they have to wake us up, right? So I haven't had a full night's sleep in you know, probably months. And I realize, what's that? You have a few more years. I have a few more years. Thank you for reminding me. Appreciate that. See, see, me after, see me after class about your grade. Um, I realize just from the amount of sleep interruption, it is tremendously, tremendously disruptive to your health, um, mental and physical. And Part of the challenge is, how many of, you, how many of us have uh, televisions in our bedroom? Show of hands. How many of you look at your smartphones in bed? Okay, good. A, a, a smaller number of people. I like to tell people that your bedroom and your bed in particular is for, is for two things. And, and one of them sleeping, right? <laughs> so, you know, if it's not that or the other thing, then you should probably find another place to do that. Right? And so we don't have a television, we don't have a television in our bedroom. Right? And I try not to look at my cell phone in bed. It's hard. It's a really hard habit to break. But people say, well, I like to read in bed and that helps me fall asleep. If you're not getting enough rest, try changing your environment. So the television is one thing, the cell phone is another. Um, 
you can get one of those white noise machines. They're made by a company called Marcan, I think, and they help to block out external noise. We used one in New York City because it's always loud there. It's always crazy. And that really helped out with sort of blocking out noise. The other thing is, how much light is getting into your bedroom? Do you have heavy enough drapes to ensure that the light is blocked out? And it's really amazing how a couple of these small changes, I started wearing earplugs. My wife and I trade off nights. One night she gets up and the other night I get up. But I put in earplugs and it allows me to have that unbroken sleep. And it's tremendously valuable to my rest and our ability to be the best parents that we want to be. And the other element is, is that people say that up to 50% of you learning a new skill or a new, uh, a new thing, new knowledge, comes from when you sleep. Because your brain is actually processing that information and resorting all the stuff that you've learned throughout the day. So if you're not getting enough sleep, try some of those activities. And then finally, the last of them is social life is social support. So many of us have our social lives around the people that we work with. And um, when we stop working, we lose some of those connections. Um, there's some evidence to show that uh, when a spouse, an elderly, uh, in, in elderly couples, when a spouse dies, that very often, uh, within 18 months, the other spouse will die. There's an increased frequency of that. And those are sad things. And, and it requires that we really think about uh, additional support that we can build into our lives. That's why you see so many of the target greeters and the greeters, I see it a lot in Florida, the Publix uh, supermarkets, these or Walmart, they hire greeters to allow these people who have retired to engage in more social activity. It's tremendously valuable to ensuring that our brain health is essential and vital and that it continues into our retirement. So, so one a benefit for them, the workers then, you're saying? Oh, without, que without question. But why does Walmart? Why does Walmart do that? Well, I'm not an economist, but I also think that Walmart, uh, if, if I had to guess, that Walmart and Target and these other companies see that as a, uh, a value to their operations that you as a customer are being greeted as you come in by a human being and that it's not, because these stores are big, right? And you walk in and you're kind of like, where, where am I? And it's nice to have a human face there greet you at the door. It gives more of a human face to the organization. Whether they get the return on their investment or not, I'm not entirely sure. We have to talk to one of our stock analysts and maybe we can figure that out. Right? Another question here? Well, yes, ma'am. They also consider it when you're a guest as opposed to just a customer. Absolutely right. right. So it personalizes, again, it personalizes the experience. And the point that I want to make here is not about whether or not Walmart is a good investment or Target <laughs> and because they personalize the experience. Right? I have another program that's about that called The Art of Wow, which we can talk about at some point. But the idea here is more that they are engaging people and these people are, uh, the, the, the employee, the, the person who is the greeter, gets a personal benefit out of that as well as the company. And so on page nine of your books, there's a spot for you to identify somebody that you might reach out to, right? So, so what are some ways that you can improve your sense of social connection throughout the day and write down one person with whom you'd like to have a stronger relationship. What would you do to facilitate? I'd like you to just think about that now. Who is somebody in your life? Maybe a friend that you've had for a while. Maybe a, a coworker that you, that you had a connection with. Who is somebody, maybe it's a family member, that you could deepen that connection with? Who would that be? And what might you do to do that? And I just want you to give uh, 30 seconds to that thought and write down your thoughts there. I'm not going to ask you to share. But does texting count? It sure does, but I think that there's uh, an added element if you could have more uh, verbal or face-to-face -face communication. Certainly take advantage of all the technology that you have available to you. But So think about who that could be. Is this more for people who are retired and not working full-time? This is for everybody. Not if you work full-time, you don't feel like you have time to go one day. Really? So if you work for, so this is an interesting question, right? The question here is, is this just for people who are retired or is this for everybody? And I would suggest as a 45-year-old full-time worker that it's for everybody. 
that the more that I do these things, and while we do target this for more people that are entering into retirement because it becomes harder to do some of these things without the constructs of work, and perhaps because we're getting older and because our cognitive decline, all of these things that I've described, it becomes that much more important for them. But this is something that I practice as well. All of these things. Yes, sir. I would venture to say that when we reach out in a social situation like this, the benefit from it is uh, incredible to yourself. Yeah. You become energized and good, good things come from that. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're saying is that that energy that you feel, that positive flow of emotion, that's a tremendous benefit. There's a lot of research to show that positive thinking, and we're going to talk about flexibility in just a minute because that's really my favorite part of this, is changing the way that we conceptually experience things has a huge impact on how we feel, on, on rates of depression. So our engagement, and that's part of what we're trying to achieve here. So it is for everybody. Okay, Fab Five recap. If you don't have good habits in these areas, Pick one, focus on it, and develop it, right? Whether it's your eating habits, your exercise habits, managing and balancing your stress, making sure you get enough rest, or this social support piece. Now let's talk about how you can build fitness in your brain and some habits that you can put in place to do that. Uh, and we're going to be talking about like any, like any muscle, you want flexibility, you want strength, and you want endurance. And the endurance piece comes last. We'll talk about that. But I like to talk about flexibility because uh, physically I am not that flexible, like touching my toes and my hamstrings are all tight. So I like to talk about flexibility in the brain. And I also think that it's one of the things that you can do no matter where you are. It's all a matter of the way that you think about stuff. And our brains are big computers. That's essentially what they are. There's lots of neurons and electrical currents that are running through and when you have thoughts and feelings. And those things uh, happen all the time and they've been happening for you since you were born. And that creates connections in your brain. And when you have repeated use of a part of your brain, you start to wear a pathway in it. When you start to experience something over and over, your brain starts to get conditioned to that. And we know this now in a much more scientific way because of the imaging equipment that we have available to us and the advances in science, we can actually look at the brain as it's working and see how the electrical currents and the different neurons are firing as we are doing different activities. Very, very sophisticated stuff that's only become available in the last uh, seven to 10 years. Tremendous advances. So when we're young, how many of you have grandkids? Yeah, younger than the age of uh, seven. Right? Great. So you know when you ask your grandkids to be creative or you see your grandkids being creative, the world is their oyster. It's a complete green field for them. And they can go anywhere and think of anything. Their creativity is unsurpassed. It's because they haven't been beaten down by school in many ways. And I say that, I say that in all seriousness. It sounds funny. But the reality is, is that as we get older, these pathways become more well-worn. And by the way, some of these things are good. It's good that we learn certain skills and we learn certain habits. You wouldn't have to want to have to learn how to tie your shoes every day. You learn that habit and you use it and it's become a pathway in your brain. You learn how to drive a car. Can you imagine consciously having to remember how to drive a car each time? You get in the car now, and I drive home, I'll drive home after the session to Boulder, and I'll get there, and I know I've driven, I don't really remember any of it. I don't remember driving the stick, or where I went, or making the turns, or how much gas I had to give it. I just did it, right? It's a habit, and that's good. And as we get even older, some of these pathways become even more well-worn. And again, some of those are good, but some of them, in the way that we experience things, is not that good. The way that we experience stress or events, the way that we conceive of different things that happen to us. And I'm going to give you some examples. But first, I want to give you an example of how this might feel to shift your flexibility in your brain. 
what it feels like to flex your brain and try something new in it and how hard it is when you have an ingrained pathway. We're going to just read this time, okay? We're going to read from the left to the right each row. So it'll be blue, red, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, red. You get the idea. We're going to do it together and we're going to do it as fast as we can. So on the count of three, one, two, three, blue, red, faster please. Fantastic. Great job. Okay? That's a pathway that's been well-worn in your brain. Some of you already know what I'm going to do now. Okay? Now we're just going to read the color. So this color is, what color is this? What color is that? Well, let's say it's purple, right? Because that's a hard thing with the different projectors. It's purple for the purposes. This one is orange. And this one is? Okay, that's fine. We'll go with that. All right? So on the count of three, same thing, but just read the color. One, two, three. Green, purple, orange. My point is made, right? It's much harder, right? Right? You're flexing your brain. Your brain is trained to think of that. I want you to look at this picture. Okay? Think very clearly. What do you feel right now? Hanging, what? On, for Hanging on for life. Climbing up. Climbing up. Scary monster. Scary monster. <laughs> Other thoughts? He made it. Triumph. Is that what you said, sir? No, just trying to get up. Trying to get up. <laughs> yep. Outward bound. Outward bound. Thank you very much. There's no rope. We would have you roped in in outward bound. Right? Liability and whatnot. So it's interesting, right? Some people look at this, and I've, d I've done this activity with people all over the country, all different ages. Some people say, oh, it's scary and frightening. Other people are like, wow, that looks like a lot of fun. We show a picture of people crying outside of a church. We say, what do you see here? Some people say, uh, there's a bunch of uh, very close friends saying goodbye to a lost one. And other people say, I see uh, the celebration of some people getting married, right? It's all in how you conceive of it. So when you think about the things that happen in your life, the stresses, the experiences that you have, how are you thinking about them? How are you experiencing them mentally? Are you looking at them as obstacles, as unfortunate things that are happening? Or are you looking at them as, this is part of life and I can learn from this? Or is there another way for me to think about this? And I'll give you an example. For me, my kids again are nine and, nine and eight, Noah and Jacob. And they're a pain in the ass a lot of the time, okay? They are 13 months apart. They are very, very energetic. And I love them dearly. They also frustrate me all the time, right? And for a long time in New York, I experienced them as frustration. I experienced them, I looked at them as, why can't you figure that out? Why can't you do that differently? And it, that created a feedback loop for me personally, because then I'm like, well, they're, you know, they're just kids, and now you feel bad about yourself because you were harsh with them, and it just it creates a bad situation, and it feeds on itself. And after looking at this program and after a bunch of other things that I did, I started thinking, well, what if I thought about it differently? What if I just experienced what they were doing in a different way? And that just meant changing the way that I thought about it, which is easier than it sounds or harder than it sounds. And now when I look at them and I say, and my first instinct is, why can't you do that differently? It's, this is a, they're learning this. They're eight and nine. This is the first time they're experiencing a lot of stuff. So what is my opportunity? My opportunity is to show them and to teach them and to help them. And that may seem like, well, of course, you're their parent. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Many of you have had the experience of hindsight, right? I'm experiencing it right now. <clears throat> and I have to actively change the way that I think about that. And that has proved tremendously helpful. Not as stressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not as stressed. I'm not as angry. 
I'm not as short with them because I just simply, same behavior from them, I'm just simply thinking about it in a different way. So when you think about things that annoy you or frustrate you or anger you or upset you, think about how you might experience that in a different way. So some things that we do, and these are listed on page 14, <clears throat> that help to build new pathways in our brain. Remember, we're thinking about the way that we've ingrained ourselves to think about something. Gratitude lists, journaling, relaxation. I'm from Boulder, I'd be remiss if I didn't say meditation, right? <laughs> but it works. There's a book out there that I'd recommend that you get, it's called 10% Happier. It's by a guy named Dan Harris. He was an MSNBC anchor, he still works at MSNBC. And he was, in many ways like me, a little neurotic, New Yorker, stressed out. And he went on a, a spiritual and emotional journey to learn about how he could be a little happier. Not 50% happier, 10%. And a lot of it came through meditation and reflective thinking techniques. So the biggest thing that I think you can do right now is on that page, on page 14, there's a place for you to write something down. And I want you to write down, right now, three things that you are grateful for in your life. They can be anything. They can be that it is sunny 300 days a year in Colorado. It can be for me, when I crest the rise at Anderson Mesa, that I get to look down on Boulder and see the flat irons in front of me. It can be today that your joints don't hurt. Whatever it is, what are you grateful for right now? Just write those three things down. <clears throat> this is a technique that takes you Literally, two minutes. You can do it every day. At the end of your day, or I would suggest that you do it at the beginning of your day. How many of you are grateful for another human being? Okay. Is that person here with you? Turn to them and tell them how grateful you are. Right? Do that every day. The, the, the feedback loop that that creates, and it may feel a little hokey at first, but what you're doing is you're activating certain processes in your brain that create a positive feedback loop, that create that positive energy. And by expressing that gratitude, the other person realizes that you are grateful for them and they express their gratitude to you. And I would suggest this is something that you can immediately introduce into your life and if I am I, willing to say I'll buy a cup of coffee if it doesn't have a positive effect, if you do it every day for a month. Do that every day for a month. And if you don't have a positive effect, we'll make sure you get my contact. I'll buy you coffee. And I'll sit down with you and talk to you about why it may not or may have worked for you. Because I believe strongly in that. Is recognizing the things that you are grateful for is a tremendous, tremendous source of positive energy for you. And it's just a matter of directing your thinking toward it. So that's flexibility, developing new ways of thinking. Strength is the next piece. And this is really about building new capability. It's about building the ability to do new things. What was the last new thing that you learned? What was the last project that you took on maybe since you retired? Did you learn a new language? Are you doing puzzles? Are you learning a new skill, a new habit? The more that you can do that type of stuff, the better your brain is able to get stronger. So you've heard of this big Lumosity suit, right? Lumosity is this uh, brain training piece. And they're getting sued, and it's unfortunate, because the problem with the Lumosity is that they were making claims that they couldn't prove, right? But <laughs> it doesn't mean that the stuff that they were asking you to do wasn't helpful to you. It was just that they overreached, right? And they're going to get a bad name for it. But the reality is, is that that's the type of stuff 
that allows you both flexibility and learning new stuff, right? So what was the last thing you learned? What was the last new ha uh, habit or hobby that you picked up? Did you learn how to cook? Are you doing puzzles? Are you doing Sudoku or crosswords? There's a reason why those activities are valuable for you in your retirement years because it's asking your brain to flex and learn new behaviors. So the one that the one that I like to focus on here because I'm a skier probably is the visualization one. So if you think about professional athletes or you think about uh, even amateur athletes, one of the activities that they go through is the process of visualizing success and thinking about how they are going to achieve the results that they want. I was at Vail uh, on Wednesday, and uh, to my wife's dismay, I was skiing by myself, uh, and I was skiing in the trees. And the trick about skiing in the trees, as many of you probably already know, is not to look at the trees. <laughs> it's to look in between the trees, because that's where you want to go, <laughs> right? And I found myself, because I knew I had to give this presentation on Saturday, I found myself thinking about this, and I practiced it. I mean, it's become a habit for me because I, I ski a lot. It's part of the reason why I moved here. But um, I found myself very actively thinking about it. And I could feel the difference in the control and the capability that I had in the conditions that I was facing just simply by thinking about it differently, by visualizing where I wanted to go. And it took real effort because those trees are hard if you hit them. And so it's really distracting a lot of the time. But you think about people like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Tiger Woods, and all of these superior athletes. One of the things that they talk about in preparation for their games or their events is that they visualize success. They visualize what it would mean if they were to succeed. And that's one of the things that you can do when you get out of bed in the morning. What does success look like for you throughout the day? And visualizing that and being intent on getting that done. So that's a, that's a strength training technique along with these other ideas of how do you learn or what are you going to learn to do differently. Okay, so one of the ways we can do that is through a memory game. So, you can't write anything down, but I'm going to give you a minute to see how many of these things you can remember. Okay, don't write anything down because that's cheating. Okay, these are going to come up. I'm going to give you one minute starting now and see how many you can remember. Okay. If you turn to page two in your books, there's a place for you to write down what you remember. I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds to see how many of those you can remember. I'll start that now. And the location. If you get the location, that's a worth a couple bonus points. About 10 seconds left. Okay, pencils down. Feels authoritarian, like saying that in the university. So uh, take a look. How many did you get? How many of you got more than 
seven. How many of you got more than eight? Nine, 10, 11, 12? 12, that's our highest? So 11, 11 is, so 12, you got 12 or 11? You got 11, that's fantastic. 12, fantastic. 12, it's great. 12, fantastic. You know, uh, phone numbers are, are, are 10 digits long, right? Because uh, our brain actually has a, a good chance of remembering 10 digits. That's part of why they're that length. Um, plus or minus, they say it's eight plus or minus two. So this is one way to actually build strength in your brain. If you do activities like this, if you do um, puzzles that you've never done before, if you do crosswords, if you do Sudoku, these are all ways to build strength in your brain. And I encourage you to do that. Now, all of these things are fine and good on their own. The challenge, and, and I think you, you spoke to this, your, your name, Donna? Donna, you said, is this good for people who are currently working and, or, or for retirees? And, and the challenge that you put out there, which is a very real challenge, is I'm busy if I'm working, right? Well, how do I find time to do all this stuff? I hear that a lot. Um, time's not the issue. It's about engagement and it's about focus. It's about intent. And... Um, what I think draws all this together and really what has allowed me to stay the path on a lot of the things that we're talking about and what I would really encourage you to do, I asked you to begin by thinking about what do you want your legacy to be? So I want you to think for a minute about somebody who was really influential and meaningful in your life. They can be here, they can be gone. Why don't you just think about them for a minute? And if you have the opportunity to tell them what they meant to you, how influential they were to you in your life, in who you became in life, what would you tell them? And I say that not to be melancholy or to, or to have you be melancholy. I say it because it's the connection to a higher purpose. It's the connection to a real core sense of who you are that will allow you to stay the course and find the time to do these things that we're talking about. These things that we, health, eating well and fitness and, you know, we know that. We know that we should. The challenge that we have is that we don't have any anchor to it. We get distracted by all of the other stuff in everyday life. But if we can connect it to something deeper in us, deeper in who we want to be, who we want to be remembered as, it's much easier for us to sustain the habits that we're talking about. And that's really the core of all this. So on page 17, there is the beginning of what I would describe as a conversation and a journey with yourself. And that is these two questions. What is your ultimate mission in life? And the second question is, how do you connect to it on an everyday basis? And when you leave here, you're going to hear other presentations. They're going to be fantastic. You're going to get back in your cars. You're going to go back to your life. Okay? And it's very easy to forget what we talked about here. If you can come back to this page sometime tonight or tomorrow and answer this question, Start on that journey. Start on that quest for what do I want to be remembered for? What do I want my life to have meant? And connect all this other stuff that we're talking about. I made this move from New York because I knew that what I wanted was a different life than I had grown up to be conditioned to think about. Living in the Northeast, running that rat race. I wanted something different for me and for my kids. When I took the job at Janus, it was because I realized that my passion is helping people, people that are willing to change. My tagline on LinkedIn has been for many years, I help people change the conversations that they are having 
to the ones that they want to have. That's my mission in life. And everything that I try and do connects to that. I'm not perfect. I have to forgive myself several times a day for straying from the path, but that's part of the journey. And it may sound very fluffy, but it allows me personally to connect in a different way to all the stuff that we're talking about. And if there's anything that I ask you to take from this, it's that. It's find that connection because we work our whole lives. Many of us, my father, 73, is retiring this year. And I'm concerned because I'm wondering about what he's going to connect to. Part of it is me and, and, and his grandkids and my wife. But he lives in New York. How is he going to sustain that? So I encourage you to think about the same thing. And when you look at your brain health assessment and you think about those areas that you might have had less check marks in, when you think about the habit that you want to enact, connect it to this higher purpose. And that hopefully will sustain you through the changes that you're hoping to make in your life. And that's what we hope from this program. So I am really thrilled to have had the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. A, a longer, more uh, fully discussed framework for, for what you presented today? Do you recommend other books? Um, I think that uh, there's a book called Be the Hero. It's by my friend Noah Blumenthal. Um, I think that's a, a fantastic book. Uh, I really like Man's Search for Meaning, which is written by Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor. Um, he later became a psychologist. Uh, and then there's another book by a guy named Marshall Goldsmith called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And that's really about change and personal change. But those are the ones that I really have connected with. And obviously, there's, there's tremendous resources in the self-help and spirituality sections. But, but those are ones that have really spoken to me personally. Other questions that you might have? We've got time for one more. One more? Yes, sir? Um, so my question is, and I'm proud of the youngest one here, you talk about the legacy you want to leave and success. And in that limbo of trying to figure out where I want to go, um, you know, what you know, age group, how would you determine success? You know, the legacy you want to leave behind. Yeah. So uh, I just want to repeat the question so that everybody here, and I want to make sure that I heard you correctly. So um, how do you determine at each phase of life what your goal, what your mission is? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're 20, you're in college, you know, you're going to go have fun. Yeah. Right now, I'm in that limbo of a few years removed, you know, job, et cetera, you know, maybe getting a family, et cetera. Sure. You're at a different phase, yeah. and you want to know, how do, I, how do I connect with what you're talking about when some of these sort of pathways haven't been as established for me? And that's a great question. And there's no one answer for people. For some people, it's connecting with their faith, right, and doing that uh, in a way. For some people, uh, for me, a lot of it was uh, doing a lot of self-reflection and self-discovery. And whether that was done through professional help, right, or through experiences that I sought out, uh, meaning you know different types of schooling uh, that I sought out or different types of jobs. I have a sister who's 18 years younger than me. My advice to her, so she's 26, my advice to her is always try everything. Don't limit yourself because of your thinking that ah, I'm not going to like that or I'm not going to do that. Try it first. And I say the same thing to my children, is you don't know until you actually give it a try. So, so there's no one answer for people, but I'd say that the, the overarching theme in learning more about what your ultimate purpose is, is that self-reflection piece. And the books that I describe really speak to that. Um, I think I'm out of time, but I, and I'm happy to answer your questions if you want to go outside, but I know that the, the man with the, the Broncos bow tie is going to slaughter me. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.